There's another word, meta-narrative. And we're not going to use it much, but this is the real word that is behind what I'm calling the grand narrative. And just because I don't want to say meta-narrative. I don't like that. I mean, it's not, doesn't, doesn't, it's not easy to say, and it's confusing. But here's what it means. It's an overarching account or interpretation of events and circumstances that provides a pattern or structure for people's beliefs and gives meaning to their experiences. Think about that for just a little bit. Um, we can also call this worldview. Uh, it's the a, it's a same idea. But tonight we're going to talk about it in terms of story, in terms of narrative, because we tell narratives. We, we tell story. We live story. So a meta-narrative or a, a grand narrative I'm replacing the word meta with grand, um, is the overarching account or interpretation of events that, and circumstances that provides a pattern or structure for people's beliefs and gives meaning to their experiences. So um, I think we can keep talking about that to the point where, where you will understand. Here's another a little bit more about it. The grand narrative, as we're going to keep talking about it in the Bible, is the story behind the stories. It's the overarching explanation. It's the why of any event or discourse. It's the main why, not the only why. There's more than one why often when we come to looking at some part of the story. So, if we go back to the blueprint metaphor, the grand narrative is the reason for this part of the drawing. It's the why for this part of the drawing. It's the why for the, for the distance between that wall and that wall and the height and all of that. It's the why behind that. Now, uh, we're kind of accustomed, back to our individualized uh, spirituality perspective, we're kind of accustomed to say that the, that, that the stories have meaning for me so if I read about how Jonah was swallowed by a fish or a whale or whatever you think it was, uh, then, then that's a good story. But when we think about the grand narrative, we ask, but what's behind that? What, what's the story behind the Jonah story? What's the story behind the whale story? See, there's a, there's a level of story that's bigger than the whale part of it. But there's a story bigger than the Jonah part of it. And that makes a huge difference. What that story is, what that grand narrative is. <laughs> when I was thinking about this, I thought about a book that uh, I don't know, you know, maybe this is a part of inspiration, I don't know. But I hadn't, I hadn't read this book to kids or grandkids for ages. I can't imagine when I last picked up this book, but it popped into my mind because of a phrase I was thinking about. You ever see Toodle? <laughs> you know that? Oh man, this is inspired material. <laughs> It is, it is full of amazing lessons. Let me read page one and two to you. Here we go. Now, boys and girls, just listen up. <laughs> far, far to the west of everywhere is the village of Lower Train Switch. 
All the baby locomotives go there to learn to be big locomotives. The young locomotives steam up and down the tracks, trying to call out the long, sad toot of the big locomotives. But the best they can do is a little tootle. It says gay little tootle, but I decided not to read that. <laughs> Lower train switch has a fine school for engines. There are lessons in whistleblowing, stopping for a red flag waving, puffing loudly when starting, coming around curves safely, screeching when stopping, and clicking and clacking over the rails. Of all the things that are taught in the lower train switch school for locomotives, the most important is, of course, what? Staying on the rails no matter what. I love that. <laughs> Doesn't want me to stop there. Oh, man. Yeah, if you start a book, you've got to finish it. I, I just think uh, tonight, for tonight's purposes, there's a lot of ways of talking about how we stay on the rails. But for the purposes of this discussion, staying on the rails with the meta-narrative, with the grand narrative, is the thing I am most passionate about uh, because it changes everything. Now, as we talk about this, you're going to probably say, well, I knew that already. I knew this. I knew that. The, the evidence, though, of how we talk about things, um, kind of how I talk about things sometimes makes me wonder, am I still on the rails? Am I still on the rails with, do I know the plan? Do I know the destination? Now, I'm not talking about heaven here. I'm talking about finishing the plan. So tonight we're going to talk about different ways of coming at that. What's, so what's the best description of the grand plan? I'm keeping you on in suspense a little bit, unless you're reading ahead, of course. But I'm keeping you in suspense a little bit because... I want to first illustrate how what we've become really comfortable with. And I'm not sure we're on the rails anymore in the general evangelical enterprise. I'm not so sure we're always on the rails. So stick with me here. One of the questions is, is the Bible such a magical, powerful tool that it just adapts to whatever we're experiencing and becomes what we need for our time? Or are we supposed to discover the unchanging narrative and adapt to that? That's, that, to me, is a serious question. And... It feels to me like so many of the people I sometimes hear speaking don't bother connecting with that unchanging narrative, but rather just assume that if I tell the Jonah story today, whatever, however we want to learn from that, is just cool. So I just ask us to think about that. I hope Peter didn't mention Jonah this morning. You didn't mention Jonah, did you? Well, I tried to pick something that nobody did. Uh, and I'm not picking on anybody. That was a good message. <laughs> caricature or reality? What's a caricature? A caricature is 
when there's an overemphasis on some part to the point where it distorts the image. So we laugh at that. You can tell who it is, can't you? But <laughs> so the, the the way this works is that I feel that a lot of the messages we focus on have become caricatures of the big plan. There are parts of, there are things we emphasize to the point where people at least make caricatures. You know what? Uh, Will Smith didn't make his own caricature. He didn't decide to do that. Somebody is poking fun at him, right? And this is the way I f uh, this is the way I feel. If we're if we're not if we don't know the grand plan well enough and work from it, we encourage people to create caricatures. Let me give you an example of one. A couple summers ago, uh, uh, some of my grandkids were at a Bible camp in the summer. They came back. One of them was telling me about one of the sessions. Now, when I tell you this, when I say it, please don't take offense because I'm telling you the caricature version of what I didn't hear the speaker, but here's, here's the caricature version of what that speaker said to a bunch of young kids. Here's how it goes. Do you kids know, how many of you kids have told a lie? Well, they all raise their hands. Do you know that you're a sinner? If you admit to having told a lie, you're a sinner. And sinners can't be in the presence of God. So, your, your destination is millions and millions of years in eternal torment. That's your destination. And that's just the first hour. That's like just one hour. Because you're, that's how it is. Because you are a sinner. And this is what the Bible tells you. Now, there's a short prayer that can fix all that. There's a simple solution. All you need to do is confess that you're a sinner and ask Jesus into your heart and those millions of years go away. I don't know how you like me doing that. But that made me furious. Because I really believe that though there's truth there, just like the picture of Will Smith, it's a kind of caricature of the real plan. Doesn't take away some of the facts that that speaker apparently referred to. But it's a caricature, and it gives people reason to, uh, to, to make awful, blasphemous memes and put them on Facebook about uh, what, it, what it means, how Jesus actually views you, and things like that. And I think we can't, 
we can't take responsibility, please understand me, we can't take responsibility for people's, um, for all of what people think. But we can encourage caricatures if we're not aware. Let's look at a few of them. This is true. The Bible tells you what is right and wrong, so read it and obey it. That's, that's not false. But if that's our message, it's a caricature I'm suggesting to you. Let me tell you how that turns into a caricature. Have you ever heard people, have you ever heard a skeptic talk about the story of Adam and Eve and the tree with fruit on it? Have you ever heard or seen how, how a skeptic views that and how in your most skeptical moments you might view that? Because sometimes the caricature version of that, I mean, I gotta go to a different slide, is like this. This is the caricature version of that story. God just needed to know if people would obey him or not. And so just like putting this thing on a dog's nose, the, only, the test really is, will you wait until I tell you? Will you do it? just the way I demand for no particular reason. Sometimes the way we talk about the beginning of sin or the, the introduction of sin, um, we encourage a caricature like that. So back to this idea it is said that if you just start to obey, the love will come. If you just take the Bible and begin to obey it, you'll eventually, your obedience will turn into love. It does for some. But if you look at the story of the Jews, the Pharisees in particular, you'd say, well, that didn't actually work out so well there. By the time Jesus showed up on earth, they hadn't developed a culture of love for God. They had developed a culture of obedience. And so though obedience is an important part of the blueprint, just like starting a relationship with Jesus is an important part of the blueprint, it's a caricature to teach it as the main message. Obedience is not the main message. Let me just back up a little bit. If you on that, on the, back to the story of my grandkids at Bible camp. With that caricature, the main message is being saved from hell and on the way to heaven, right? That's, what, that's what's behind that caricature. And we're so used to that caricature that we don't even, we don't even, well, except for more contemporary thinking, people really go like this about it. And so some of us who are um, more fundamental push even harder toward, since people resist that caricature, we push even harder to make sure that remains a, a fundamental part of our message. 
And so the caricature gets stronger in some ways, or at least we encourage it. Um, if you want a more detailed discussion about, uh, or, or if you just review how with, if you could review without some of the current um, thinkings or, or messages, read John 3 over again, for example, when Jesus talked to, the, to Nicodemus about being born again. Read that over again and think about how did Nicodemus get born again? Or did he? If so, how? Um, you'll find that Jesus never told him how. That's kind of shocking when you think about that. That Jesus never told him what to do. He just talked about how amazing that miracle is. And so, and then if you combine that with whole chapters, I'm just trying to make you read more carefully, but if you combine that with a whole chapter like Matthew 25, where that's some confusing stuff, what Jesus taught there in terms of what our story about salvation generally is. That's some confusing stuff. And we have some gymnastics we use or some contortions we use to explain what Jesus actually meant there. Uh, but just reread that in, in case you're wondering if it's a simple formula like a, saying about a 10-word prayer and making everything right. If if that's how it is, uh, you the one with the hardest proof burden from Scripture to support it. But that doesn't mean that salvation's not part of the picture. It is. It doesn't mean that obedience isn't part of the picture. But let's not make it a caricature. There's numerous other ones. One of the most popular ones is everybody needs spirituality. Uh, we, can, we can do all kinds of ones. I'm not going to, I don't have time to go through all of these. Um, there have been movements like just understand the principles from the Bible. Then you can control your life. You can actually replace relationship with God for a relationship with the Bible. If you listen to how some people talk, that's, that's how it feels. They have, a, they have a more describable relationship with the Bible than they do with the one who is the architect of the plan. We can say, you're amazing. God wants to affirm you and fulfill your dreams. We, can, we say sometimes, you need spiritual power, or that's what people hear, and God's the best source for that. And one of the most popular ones today, everybody needs spirituality, a religion, sort of like everybody needs a car and forge are the best, so why would you get anything else? That's how some of us argue or communicate our message hey, we all need spirituality. Christianity is the only one that really works. We can do better than that. What grand narrative? Think about this one. Let's think about this a while. Everything God does is to create fellowship, communion, and partnership with the people he loves, and to abide, live, dwell with those people in complete shalom. Now, I'm not much for uh, picking Hebrew words, and I'm not a wannabe Jew. 
But the word shalom has some amazing connotations with it. And, and that's what's in the parentheses there. Shalom actually means peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. In other words, the life abundant, as Jesus used the words, life abundant. So I'm not asking you to sign on to, a, 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 to this right away. I, I, I want you to start thinking about it. Start meditating on what would be different if, every, if the highest level of story were that one. See, at, at one level we have a grand narrative. At another level we have the, the things we read um, the stories, events, and teachings. And then at another level, we have the uh, uh, even more details. So what if we start, what if we start thinking about all of these levels in terms of a grand narrative, something like this, and we say, and we look at a detail like the fish spit Jonah out after three days. That's a detail. It's part of a story that's a little bit bigger. And what we often have trouble with is how does that story fit into the grand narrative? One of the ways we talk about that sometimes is, well, you can see little tidbits of Jesus in there, or you can, you can see something there. Or you, that, that sounds a lot. See what Jesus said about Jonah being in the, in the fish for three days and three nights? That makes a connection. It, it does, and all those things are true. But think about this, think about coming at it this way. Let me tell you why this, uh, some of this is my thinking, but not nearly all of it. So I don't take credit for, for all of this. Uh, but I used words that are repetitive, that almost sound like, the same thing, like synonyms, but they're not exactly. And I just used a bunch of different words because to keep expanding the, our, our concept of what God is after. And I challenge you to start reading from the first word in the Bible until the last word in the Bible and see if this doesn't hold out as a strong, overarching message. Let's think about it. Just uh, let's, let's take some jumps through there. First of all, some people's story says that the Bible starts out with the sin problem. I, I strongly disagree with that. The Bible does not start out with the sin problem. The Bible starts out with God dwelling with his people he, he created. That's how the Bible starts. He, he was a co-laborer with them. He was with them. They had the same plan. They had the same idea. They had, they had work they shared in common. They had felt, they had everything. And God was pleased to be with them, to dwell. It was complete shalom. And of course, sin entered the world because people said, we can do better than this. People said, we can do better than that. There's, there's, we're, we're, we're not content to be just a partner 
we want to be an owner or something like that, however you want to say it. But that's how it started. Then we, we fast forward at different points in time. And one of the key uh, illustrations of this grand narrative comes again with the tabernacle and the people. Do you know what the word tabernacle means and what the Hebrew connotation of the usage there is? Dwelling, residing, living. It, it has all of those beautiful ideas. God was not orchestrate, he was not content to orchestrate things from somewhere else. He was determined, even with people who kept going like this and people who kept saying over and over, we can do better than this. And they kept pushing back. They kept resisting God's attempt at all of this. And still, God was determined to live with them. God was determined that this is together, that this is with. And if you start reading the Old Testament with this in mind rather than the sin theme, it will, it will transform how you read those stories. It will transform what you think they're for. It will help put the sin into perspective. Yes, the sin is a big problem, but why is the sin a problem? Not just so, not just so that the eternal destiny, God never, I don't, I don't find that God ever spoke to the people of Israel about their eternal destiny. Did he? Can you think? Uh, he never did. That was never the issue. He wanted to dwell with them. He wanted to partner with them. And that's how this people came into the New Testament era. That's how they came expecting the Messiah. They came expecting the Messiah not to fix them so they could sometime be in an eternal bliss. They expected that Messiah to come and rule and restore and redeem the earth and the government and the world. And in fact, Jesus began that but he did it in a way that shocked them so badly they couldn't see it. They couldn't, they didn't catch on. They lost, they became untethered, and many other followers have failed to get retethered to a plan like this. And you jump, and, and so when Jesus came, once again, God was accomplishing what he wanted. What's one of the names of Jesus? Emmanuel. Hugely important. God with us. And once again, everything God did was to create fellowship, communion, and partnership with the people he loves what difference would it make to a group of kids at a Bible camp if the main message was founded not on millions of years of suffering in eternal damnation, even though that may have some truth to it, But what if the message was founded on God wants to partner with you? He, there's a plan. This is going somewhere. And the resurrection of Jesus was the greatest turning point 
in heading this all in the direction of the redemption of the entire universe, and you're a partner, if you will be, if you don't keep doing this, you're a partner in that. You're, God is eager to do it with you and with me and to bring justice and all of the things that are part. Oh, I missed my slide here partly. But the idea of temple tabernacle is the theme. The incarnation is the most amazing expression of that narrative. And Jesus kept saying things like this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is near you. It's not far. It's not, it's not heaven sometime. He said it's in you. He says right here. It's not only in eternity. And he also kept saying things like, the kingdom of heaven is justice. And his prayer that he taught on earth as in heaven. Justice is a huge part of it. And it is an important part of it that reconciliation from our estrangement with God is part of it. That's, that's critical. But that's God's action. He decided to reconcile us to himself. He takes the initiative. He took the initiative to reconcile us to himself. Let's not make it a caricature. It's, it's a huge part of it. But it's not the story. You know what happens when that becomes the story? Then people pray the prayer and then, then we're kind of at loose ends. Then we're not quite sure. So we need some books now. Uh, we, need a, we need a discipleship book. We need to learn how to do prayer and Bible reading. And we gotta keep, we gotta, we gotta keep this little train on the tracks now. But we're actually off the tracks already because we're not, we're not often successful at enticing people, inviting people, and encouraging people to be a full, all-in partner with where God is headed with this thing. Because the only destination we describe is someday you'll be in heaven instead of hell. That's a poor description of the plan. In my view, do you see a difference? Are you willing to at least meditate on this for a week and, and see how it changes, see how it can change to, to start back further? We talk often about just got to dig deeper into the word, got to dig deeper, help people dig deeper. I think there's a big problem with digging deeper right now because we don't know the we don't know here. So why dig deeper until we know what this is? When you dig deeper without this clearly firmly in place, not just the knowledge of it, but an operating system. It's like it's like the operating system in your computer. If we, we act, we do the stories and events, our messages and, and the details of how we live come out of the operating system that we have, whether it's uh, iOS, whatever Apple calls theirs, and, or whether it's Windows or what it is. That's, how, that's, that's the way we're going to write. That's the way we're going to speak. That's the way we're going to live. That's how, we, that's how we act it out. I think if the operating system is, is adjusted, we get back on the rails with, a, with an operating system with a grand plan that, that explains 
all of Scripture, not just the few pages that we need if it's a salvation message. You know what? You can do the, you can do the main evangelical message with about four pages of the Bible, and the rest we're not quite sure what to do with. I said something similar last week. And people, we, we give them a Bible and they say, where should I start or what should I read? Well, I don't know. We're afraid if, we send, if they get started in Isaiah, they're going to get confused. If they, go to, if they go to Song of Solomon, they'll be even worse. If they, <laughs> if they go to Leviticus, it'll be a big mess. What are we going to tell them? So we just say, well, well, I don't know. Start with Matthew. Start with John. Start, start. We, we think, start with something safe. You know, you wouldn't have to say that if you took the time to give them an idea. I, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, it's not magic. But what if, instead of trying to get them to your favorite part right away, what if... What if you help them understand the grand narrative? Say, you know what really, what really matters is that God has a plan for this entire universe, including you and me. And I know we've said that. Everybody said, God has a plan for your life. Usually, what, usually we're not. Anyway, we have all kinds of meanings for what that means. But anyway, if we said God is restoring justice, God is headed toward setting this world right. We know it's not right. We know, it's, we know that things are in, in a mess. God is headed toward setting it right, and you can be part of it. He needs, he, he wants us. He wants to do it together. He wants to do it with us. Of course, there's faith and there's reconciliation and there's, there's learning to say yes to God instead of practicing pushback to get in the habit of saying yes. Instead of having individual spiritualities, get in the habit of saying yes because there's a plan, because there's a grand narrative, because there's a, there's a place this... This whole thing is going, and God has a blueprint, and the details are important, but make sure you got the grand plan first before you read any part of the Bible. That's what I would say to people. It's scary business to tell people to just start reading without having any idea whether, where to tether things they're reading. You've heard people say, no, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. What am I supposed to do with that psalm that tells me to that prays for all the destruction of my enemies and all that? What, sp- what in the world is that all about? What's the... Yeah. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, it doesn't simplify everything in the Bible. And it doesn't explain everything in the Bible easily because it's a complicated book, but this is a starting place. And I have lots more, but here's what I ask you to do. Think about that. Meditate on this for a week and see whether God confirms in your heart that that should reorient us and get us back on the rails where we will stay no matter what. Staying on the rails no matter what. Ethan's got the book. Oh, no. Did you finish the book? <laughs> no. He was going to read it at break, but I cut the break too short probably. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Uh, you, I, I will take questions or comments if you want to do it. Do you?